Hi everybody and welcome to week two of Food as Medicine and our feedback video for this week. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the content that we've been uh, learning about this week and also um, back to some of the content from last week as well. So let's have a look at some of those activities now that uh, um, more people have had a chance to, to have a go at them. So first of all, I just wanted to mention about the new foods. It is so great to see everyone, as I mentioned last week, trying new foods or listing out the new foods they wanted to try. And I also mentioned that I also wanted to try some new foods as well and go along the journey with you and I was going to show you this week actually the new foods that um I had chosen to try however unfortunately there's been a bit more of a COVID outbreak around um, some of the suburbs for me here and so I've just been limiting uh, going out so I didn't get to the the um, the normal uh, fruit and vegetable stores that I not um, usually would where I would go and choose uh, my new foods to try for this week so I do a lot of the time like to try having new fruits and vegetables so hopefully I'll be able to get there for next week um, but I hope all of you keep talking about the foods you've tried how you use them also have a look bit of a look to see what nutrients are in them and what those um, nutrients are good for um, for health as well and share that with everyone now another activity from last week we saw um, the superfood activities listed for everyone to do and we hope that um, you've enjoyed doing that and I've had a re read through all the comments um, so far for that activity and I wanted to say that you're all spot on around um, your view on the term of superfoods and this was the point of the activity that um, there isn't a hard and fast uh, definition in the nutrition world for superfoods uh, it's more of a marketing term Term because um, you know there are many foods that are classified or considered to be really great for health and could be considered a superfood but a lot of the time that term sort of gets hijacked and foods become really popular for a, um, a certain period of time and they're called superfoods and we're all told to have them and half the time they skyrocket in price as well and they can be sometimes hard to access when there are other foods that can be just as healthy but they don't necessarily have that trendy association with them and ones I can think of you know over the last couple of years have been kale you know there's been a huge resurgence in kale and don't get me wrong kale's a really healthy food and really great to have but there are also other dark green leafy vegetables out there that are also quite healthy and perhaps more accessible in some countries um, and some of you might actually prefer the taste of other dark green leafy vegetables than kale um, and they may also be cheaper one comes to mind is silver beet um, or um, the larger leaf spinach there so really thinking about those terms superfoods and what I wanted to mention about the results for the terms of superfoods um, for this this run of the course and we've run this course um, for a number of years now and this is the first time I've seen blueberries actually knocked off the top of the list so far they're sitting in I think it's second place and we've got people saying that broccoli is um, is there uh, their favorite superfood I suppose you could use um, use those terms so um, the point of this activity was actually all the foods listed at some point or other have been deemed a superfood in the media they're all really healthy foods but you can just see from the diversity of responses from you all just how all our um, I guess opinions and views on foods and which ones are superfoods are all actually different but it doesn't necessarily mean those foods are any less healthy or more healthy than they are so please just be careful with the term superfood and when you see it on packages or on information that you find online and really reflect and do um, you know a bit more um, research around why it's being called a superfood and are there other foods that in fact have similar um, similar health properties that may be more accessible for you okay so let's jump into some of the information for week two here first up we had food in the gut and it's really great to see um, a number of you commenting on how interesting you found this information and how it's um it's become quite clear in terms of all the different uh uh, parts of the puzzle in regards to carbohydrates how they're digested in the body and also health so and that's really great to see and we, we love hearing that um, you're all enjoying the information there and carbohydrates certainly over the over the years have have had a bad rap in in terms of what they mean for our health and for very ultra processed and very very refined carbohydrates that is that is quite um you know um 
quite correct you know they're not great for health and we should all be reducing those intakes of those refined carbohydrates and those um, refined added sugars to products but just from this um, information you can also see there's such a wealth of different types of carbohydrates with their classifications there and the different roles they play in the body and so it's really important that we understand those different carbohydrates where they come from in the diet and how they might be um, contributing to our health in, um, in different ways so uh, if you haven't had a look at that section uh, please do please do have a look and we actually had a question there that I wanted to to briefly touch on um, in regards to food in the gut and I think it's an excellent question so the question was someone was around um, would the oligosaccharides and those dietary fibers that is resistant to easy digestion be an explanation or part explanation for the low glycemic index rating and so for all of you out there that don't know what the low GI um, index rating is it it looks at how quickly food uh, carbohydrates are digested in the body and it gives foods a rating a, um, a GI rating and so it it can be used especially by diabetics to help I guess include more low GI foods in their in their diet because they are um, digested more slowly by the body and so they release their sugars into the body more slowly and it can help keep blood sugar levels more stable and in fact many of us should be eating more lower GI carbohydrates and yes dietary fiber is um, one component that does affect the GI of foods but it's also not the only component and um, you can get um, high fiber foods that also have a high GI and a lot of the time that comes down to the type of fiber that's in that food and also how that food has been processed as well and so um, how that fiber appears in that food is it more like the original um, you know fiber or has it been processed and so it's been um, you know perhaps refined more and so the body is able to um, digest it more or not digest it because it's a fiber but the enzymes are able to get to it more easily um, and, um, and and metabolize that there. So it's um, it is partly the answer. You can also have if you look at um, the FODMAP content of foods, you can have um, you can have high and low GI foods that are have differing FODMAP contents as well. So it's not just a black and white rule that say all low GI foods are all low FODMAP foods. It's not it's not that at all. There, there is a lot of complexity behind um, those classifications for both those rating scales. And you can get um, foods that sit on, on um, different ends of, the, of each of those spectrums there. But yes, in, in um, answer to, to part of that original question around fiber having a role to play in, in the GI of foods, yes it, yes, it can. And um, from the uh, oligosaccharides, also those more soluble fibers, absolutely, uh, they can slow that digestion down. And moving on to another topic in week two, which um, uh, people have started to come to, and one that many people do find interesting when they come to it in the in the course is the food in our genome. And um, it's a lot of new information for a lot of people, and um, I hope you enjoy reading that. And that's an area of um, of um, interest for me in the world of nutrition. And so. Uh, understanding how our diet can affect um, our, our genes or our, our genome there but also how our genetics affects our nutrient requirements and there is a lot of complexity and a, a, the reason I wanted to touch on this is there was a comment from a learner um, mentioning that the jury is still out on this research and that perhaps it will be so indefinitely as we start to unravel what we are finding and discovering and I just wanted to comment on that and say yes I see where you're coming from with that comment and it is a very complex area and the more we learn the more questions we seem to have and so um, we do need to recognize that and know that um, for a lot of the stuff we learned it's not necessarily ready to be implemented in nutrition practice just yet but we wanted to bring you the newer knowledge because um, there is so much research going on in that space and I think it's important for people to start to be aware that we are all different we are all individuals um, and, our, and our genetics plays a big role in that and that um, moving forward is um, we, we are seeing that this may mean that one size fits all nutrition recommendations in the future may not be entirely appropriate for all of us or they may just be a, a starting point with what we're seeing sort of now they're just a starting point and that we're able to begin to tailor um, our um, diets a little bit more towards each of us as individuals but yes there's still a long way to go to be able to 
do that um, completely. And so we should still be following our public health messages as a really good starting point. Uh, and uh, there was another comment and question in that section around um, around isn't our DNA formed or set near to the point of conception and and yes it is we we do um, have our um, inherit our DNA from our um, our parents however our cells do continue to replicate um, and so when they do replicate that DNA needs to be replicated um, along with that cell and so during that replication process there are a number of nutrition factors that are important in, in supporting that replication process and making sure that that goes well and then we also have um, uh, nutrition supporting uh, and helping to repair DNA damage so our DNA as we as we go through life can be damaged and so we want to make sure that those repair mechanisms are functioning well and then we also have um, nutrition that can affect the expression of our genes so looking at um, nutrigenomics and also epigenetics and that uh, our environment including our diet can sometimes affect which genes are turned on and turned off at certain times and in certain parts of the body and and so we do have nutrition affecting, um, I guess, um, the outputs from our DNA in different in different ways, and that's why um, we wanted to sort of bring this topic uh, to your attention. But but you're absolutely right from that comment that um, our DNA is inherited um, from conception from our parents. But that's I suppose one aspect of um, of genetics and genomics and everything that we're learning about there. Okay, so that's it from, from me today. I just wanted to also um, point out just very quickly the um, the topic on food addiction. And so if you haven't had a look at that, please please do. But what I wanted to say was be mindful about how we're, we're commenting about food addiction and that it is, it is a, another complex area. Um, behavior and food is quite complex. And so we must be careful how we write um, our comments. And I say this in every run of the course. I'm not, I'm not saying it specifically because of any comment in this course, um, but I'm just wanting to highlight just because they're, um, you know, many of us, we all have different relationships with food. And so we just need to be careful how we write our comments um, because we don't know who's going to be reading them and how they're feeling about food um, and how they eat. And so, have a have a bit of a reflect on the topic of food addiction and, and, and answer those questions there and also have a think about that as well. So that's it from me today. Keep those comments coming um, and uh, keep discussing the information with each other. I'll be here for week three. This is where we'll be looking at implementing the science of food um, as medicine and how we know if information is right. So uh, take care everyone and I'll see you next week.